Tonight, a Markham man has pleaded guilty to killing four of his family members. The man's mother, father, sister and grandmother were found dead in their Markham home last summer. Plus... We have to focus on the people that need a test because of their jobs or if they've been around someone that uh, tested positive. The province changes its tune on who should get a COVID-19 test and... And we have unearthed some disturbing facts. The group Fair b, &B says short-term rentals continued to operate in Toronto even when they were banned to curb the spread of COVID-19. Good evening, I'm Maravel Tarouk. It has been a deadly night on GTA streets with three shootings and a cyclist fatally struck. Let's begin in North York where one person is dead and two people are injured after two separate shootings. The first happened at Gosford Boulevard and Shoreham Drive near Jane and Steeles at around 8.30. Police say multiple shots were reported. They found two victims with gunshot wounds. One of the victims was without vital signs. Paramedics tried to save his life, but he died at the scene. The other victim was taken to hospital with serious but not life-threatening injuries. Less than an hour later, just minutes away, at Futura Drive and Driftwood Avenue, police responded to another shooting. A man in his 20s was rushed to hospital with serious injuries. Police say the suspect fled that scene in a car. Across town in Scarborough, a man is in hospital with life-threatening injuries after a shooting there. Police were called to the scene at Lawrence Avenue and Galloway Road just after 7.30 tonight. They found the victim at the scene suffering from gunshot wounds. He was rushed to hospital. Police say there are reports of a light-colored car fleeing the area. And a cyclist is dead after being hit by a car near Kensington Market tonight. It happened in the area of Dundas West and Denison Avenue just after 6 o'clock. Paramedics performed CPR on the man before he was rushed to hospital. He died shortly after arriving there. Police say the driver remained on scene. The intersection is closed while police investigate. A 23-year-old man has pleaded guilty to four murder charges in the killing of his mother, father, grandmother and sister, found dead inside their Markham home last July. Menhaz Zaman pleaded guilty to three counts of first-degree murder and one count of second-degree murder in a new market court today. He was arrested on July 28th last year at his family home on Castlemore Avenue after police discovered his family members dead inside. Shortly after the incident, Zaman appeared to have sent online messages about the killings and several graphic photographs of dead bodies and bloody weapons to friends on a gaming platform. Zaman will be sentenced on October 26th. An about face from the Ford government. After previously saying anyone who wants a COVID-19 test can get it, provincial officials now say if you don't need a test, you shouldn't get one. As Lorenda Redekop explains, the new guidance comes as Ontario reports another 409 new cases of COVID-19 today. Another day, another lineup that stretches around the block. This family gave up and left. This is ridiculous. Outside another hospital, this man tried to make the best of it and ordered McDonald's. Thank you. Today, the province announced a plan to cut these long waits. One billion dollars for testing and contact tracing and new guidance on who should go for a test. We have to focus on the people that need a test because of their jobs or if they've been around someone that uh, tested positive. It means people without symptoms or other risks could be turned away from getting a test. It comes just a day after the Premier announced testing in pharmacies for people without symptoms. Ford acknowledged the switch. I was the guy up here for months over and over again saying get tested, get tested. Health officials say testing everyone is a drain on resources. There is of no value. In fact, what we found is when there's very little COVID in that group, what we end up with is false positives. But with cases rising, some experts want the province to make a much bigger change. 
Today, a group of 38 doctors called on the province to immediately place restrictions on non-essential businesses, including dine-in restaurants, bars and nightclubs, as well as gyms, places that increase possible exposure. We're going to make sure that we review the numbers and, and if it's a huge spike, everything's on the table. I, I will listen to our health experts. People seem to agree with the government's new guidelines when it comes to testing. There. There's yeah. a huge testing backlog, as I think everyone understands. And if you open the doors too widely, we won't get through the symptomatic people who need it the most. This mother and son both have cold symptoms and agree with the new rules. I understand people could be asymptomatic, but these are really long lines. And it could be shorter for everybody who actually needs the, the tests done. Without a negative test, he has to sit at home, away from school, for two weeks. Lorenda Radakop, CBC News, Toronto. Increased testing is just one part of the province's fall preparedness plan to fight COVID-19. The full plan is being released over a number of days. Tonight, CBC Toronto News has obtained a draft copy of the entire document. It was leaked to our Queen's Park reporter, Mike Crawley, who has the details, including whether the province plans any more lockdowns. Just how hefty is Ontario's plan for managing COVID-19 this fall? The Premier has been selling it pretty strongly. Massive, massive plan. It's very robust. It's jammed with items. If we just ram it down, you know, uh, on the table and, and just start rolling it all out, it, it's not going to be absorbed by the, the, the people out there. Counting the cover, the draft plan obtained by CBC News is 21 pages long. It shows how a small, moderate or large second wave of the pandemic would affect the province. But no matter how severe the second wave turns out to be, the plan recommends targeted closures rather than another lockdown or taking Ontario back to stage two. Now we're doing all these measures to make sure we can keep the economy moving, moving forward. We aren't at that point right now. But again, everything's on the, on the table. The big ticket item in the plan is nearly $1.4 billion on a range of public health measures, such as more testing capacity and preventing the spread of the virus. There's also nearly $500 million to help hospitals cope with a surge in patients, almost $300 million to reduce backlogs in surgeries, MRIs and x-rays, and $30 million to handle outbreaks in schools and long-term care. The government isn't revealing the whole document until next week. Today, CBC News reports that they have a copy of a plan which is entirely incomplete, despite us being in the midst of the second wave. Doug Ford has had months to be ready for this moment, and he has failed, and failed badly. The plan admits Ontario's hospitals are once again becoming overcrowded. It proposes clearing hundreds more beds to make way for a rise in patient numbers, whether from the flu or COVID-19. To tackle the backlog for medical procedures, the plan calls for private clinics to do publicly funded surgeries, as well as MRIs and X-rays. Mike Crawley, CBC News, Toronto. TDSB students who have opted to learn at home may have to wait another week to get online. The school board confirming tonight that despite already hiring 400 teachers since just the beginning of the week, they still need another 100 teachers to meet the demand. And while some virtual classrooms may finally be up and running tomorrow, some students may have to wait until the end of next week to start their lessons. Well, a kindergarten class at a West End school is in isolation after a staff member tested positive for COVID-19. 26 students from Swansea Junior and Senior Public School are now at home and parents have been told to monitor for symptoms. Their classroom has been sanitized and disinfected. None of the students has tested positive so far. And for privacy reasons, the school board wouldn't confirm who the staff member is. They'll only say no other classroom at the school was impacted. With COVID-19 cases rising fast in Toronto and across much of the country, experts say Canadians need to start wearing masks more often and in more places, even outside. Lauren Pelly has the latest. Mark Hansen helps manage this Toronto video store. He says most customers now wear masks, but not always properly. I think a lot of people tend to put a mask on and 
think it can go under their nose or sag down or they can keep taking it off and drinking coffee. And it's happening more often. There's just a bit of a laissez-fairness with the masks now. Wear a mask as often as you can, in as many places as you can, for as long as you can. Especially when you're with people you don't live with. That was the message from Toronto city officials this week, calling on residents to wear masks more, not less. The recommendation comes amid rising cases of COVID-19 across much of the country and widespread public support for mask wearing. One recent online survey found 83% of surveyed Canadians feel governments should mandate masks in all indoor public spaces, while 87% believe wearing one is a civic duty. I think we, we all need to be accountable to say, okay, this is just part of our normal lives. Many medical experts agree Canadians should be keeping their mask on around anyone outside your household, whether that's an essential worker or your own friends and family. If it's an indoor environment and you can't uh, get that good two meter space all the time, wear, think about wearing a mask, even if it, if it is family members. That applies in crowded outdoor settings as well. Keep your mask on longer at a patio, right until you eat or drink, or when you make those quick trips to a nearby store. If all these people are coming in and not wearing masks or wearing them below their nose, that puts these people at risk. People like Hansen and his team. We need to keep things as clean as possible for the safety as our, of our staff and of the customers too. And remember, hand washing and keeping a safe distance still matter too. These little pieces of fabric are just one tool to help try and stop the spread of COVID-19. Lauren Pelly, CBC News, Toronto. The Toronto Blue Jays are heading back to the playoffs for the first time since 2016. The club officially clinched a postseason berth with a 4-1 win tonight against the New York Yankees. Regular season play continues through Sunday and the playoffs begin on Tuesday. All first round series will be best of three matchups in this pandemic altered season. This will be a first playoff appearance for most of the team's young core, including Vladimir Guerrero Jr., Bo Bichette, Kevin Biggio, and Nate Pearson. The advocacy group Fair b, &B is calling on the province to reinstate its ban on short-term rentals as cases of COVID-19 climb. It also revealed some concerning statistics for Toronto during the few months when the ban was in place. As Kelda Yoon reports, it says the province and the city need to take action now to prevent community spread. This downtown condo is in a prime location by the waterfront. Becca Young lives there with her partner and young son. This is, you know, a party building. It's like living on the floor of a hotel. Even on the way down here, someone was asking me for directions to the LCBO. I mean, I'm often a tour guide here because there are almost no people that know the neighborhood or live here. When the city banned short-term rentals from April to June, Young said she did see a decrease in short-term renters, but they weren't completely gone. We have unearthed some disturbing facts. The group Fair b, &B found 12% of Airbnb rentals continued to operate in the city during the ban. While most only had one or two reviews, almost 100 were high volume listings. In almost every case, you saw a steady stream of different guests coming once every couple of days, continuously through the entire period. Many were in downtown waterfront communities, which has been seeing a rise in COVID cases in recent weeks. Seeing those numbers does scare me and it makes us nervous for myself and my family. Airbnb announced Monday that it has suspended 40 listings across Ontario after complaints of partying. But with COVID cases rising, Fairbnb wants the province to step in and reinstate the ban. It also wants to see more enforcement by the City of Toronto. Most of them were likely already illegal, violating Toronto's short-term rental bylaws. They were ghost hotels, entire homes, removed from the long-term housing market being used for tourist rentals. Earlier this month, the city announced new rules. Anyone wanting to rent out their primary residence through short-term rental sites like Airbnb must first register their property with the city, and they have until the end of December to do that. This is aimed at eliminating these so-called ghost hotels. In addition to the ban, I, I agree that I would love to see regulation happen or, you know, real regulation and, and reinforcement of that and, um, 
and that's that's so important and it's you know really what we need to be safe here. In the meantime, Airbnb is encouraging concerned neighbors to call its 24 seven hotline if they have a complaint. It says complaints through its hotline led directly to many of the suspensions. Kelda Yoon, CBC News, Toronto. Farama is more than just a Chinese bakery. It's a meeting place in the community, and after 30 years, it's closing its doors. I'm Angelina King. I'll have more on what makes this place so special and what some people say its closure means for the future of the neighborhood. That's coming up. Well, we've got the heat. We're going to start adding a little more humidity. I'm meteorologist Colette Kennedy. And then how long is this all going to be lasting? I've got the answers. Those are coming up after the break. A popular bakery in Chinatown is closing its doors next week. Farama Cake and Des Dessert Garden has been a staple along Spadina Avenue, serving customers for more than 30 years. Our Angelina King spoke with customers, sorry to see the local landmark go. For the last decade, Sean Krusen has been going to Farama every afternoon for a donut and coffee. The reason I come here is because of the quality of the products and actually the people that are serving them. Kind of feels a little like home, so I know they're here for the community, and it, it's heartbreaking to see them leave. 
While he'll soon have to find a new routine, other customers made a special trip to stock up before Ferrama closes. I can't believe it's going. It's like kind of like a huge part of my childhood. Like uh, back when I lived in Markham, uh, we used to make trips down here all the time just to get this. The owner of Ferrama declined an interview, but a sign in the window says they're sad to close and thanks their customers. Food is very strong in, in Chinese tradition. Chinatown historian Arlene Chan says Ferrama is a meeting place, especially for the elderly, where people feel comfortable to linger and enjoy affordable traditional food. So I think it's going to be really missed in the community because it is a very unique and yet at the same time very familiar traditional kind of place. Losing Ferrama means that we're, we're chipping away at the, the number of bakeries. It's not entirely clear why Ferrama is closing. The sign says it's due to difficult circumstances and that it's even more sad to close during the pandemic. Plus, the building is for sale. The chair of the Chinatown BIA says the area was hit hard during the pandemic and while business is back to about 50 percent, things were already slowing down before. It just changed with the demographic. People get older, people retire, new people, new young entrepreneurs coming into the area. They have greater vision, new ideas. Tony Louie welcomes development in the area, saying higher density and a diverse population will drive business and vibrancy. But others feel local businesses and the area's heritage may not survive. Our community is going to gradually change. Eventually, maybe we might not see Chinatown. Ferrama closes its doors on Tuesday, but some people are optimistic that another Chinese business will replace it. All of this while Chinatown tries to find that balance between bringing vibrancy back to the area while keeping the culture and character. Angelina King, CBC News, Toronto. A cool morning, a warm afternoon, and then rain showers. A lot going on in the weather today, and Colette is here with what else is in store for us heading into the weekend. Colette. Thanks, Maravelle. Well, you know, mostly it was a really nice day today. I say that because just a few areas where we had those isolated showers that popped up, showers and even the thunderstorm activity with some lightning strikes there. But really, the warmth there, a little bit of humidity building as well. And over the next three days, we are going to find our temperatures still running above seasonal. Now, showers again, likely holding off till about Monday. It's going to be close, but it seems like they want to hold off and stay out of our weekend forecast. Now, temperatures will cool down after those three days, but the bigger drop is really going to be midweek next week, and you're going to notice that one because we're kind of acclimatized to these warmer temperatures, right? The daytime temperatures today, kind of interesting. Right around 2 p.m., everybody kind of warming up, enjoying it. Right around 24 degrees, this is at Pearson, and then as that isolated cell moved through, yeah, that dipped the temperature right down. It kind of moved from the west through right down the downtown core and over across Toronto, Toronto Island. So that brought the reading down and then it popped back up once that cell had moved through. So some nice readings, Hamilton in the mid 20s, St. Catharines as well. So still just a few little cells off towards the northeast. Otherwise, we're finding just a bit of patchy fog overnight tonight into tomorrow morning that should burn off pretty quickly. There might be a few areas where the visibility is a little bit reduced. Otherwise, it's going to be mostly sunny skies for most of the GTA in the Golden Horseshoe, a little more cloud cover further towards the east and to the north. Otherwise, into the afternoon, there could be a few pockets with some cloud cover, but we're looking at sunshine and we're looking at sunshine again as we go into Saturday as well. Now, Sunday, we will inherit a little more cloud cover, but like I said, it looks like it's going to be Sunday night, Monday, before we're going to be seeing those showers moving in. So for southwestern Ontario, this is what we're talking about for your temperatures tonight. Patchy fog also possible through here. Tomorrow afternoon, the readings looking like this. There's your average high. So good five degrees above that in terms of these daytime temperatures overnight tonight through the GTA and beyond through the Niagara region. 15 St. Catharines for the low tonight and tomorrow afternoon your highs looking like this say Catherine's you might grab 27 otherwise we're looking at mostly 26 off to just a tiny bit cooler there for Oshawa into Saturday 26 again 26 maybe even 27 on Sunday and then Monday Tuesday temperatures dropping down towards 20 22 in there and then they're going to drop a little bit further like I said into Wednesday that's when we're not only going back to seasonal 
actually a little bit below. So let's enjoy the heat for now. The weather is brought to you by Train, the most reliable heating and cooling brand. We test, so it runs. It's hard to stop a train. The University of Toronto received a $250 million gift today, the largest donation in Canadian history. This is the ideal time to invest in medicine, and there is no better institution than the University of Toronto to trust with our donation. The Timurdi Foundation is behind the donation, established by well-known philanthropists, the Timurdi family. The funds will support advances in machine learning at U of T in areas like medicine, biomedical research, and health science. It will also support the creation of a new state-of-the-art faculty of medicine building named after the family. Mayor John Tory praised the donation. To give $250 million to our Faculty of Medicine at the University of Toronto so that we can remain again in another field as leaders in the world and to address things like COVID-19 and a host of other things that affect people in their daily lives and keep them healthy is just an extraordinary uh, gesture of community solidarity.
The gift also includes a $10 million allocation to the Dean's COVID-19 Priority Fund. It supports frontline faculty members and trainees, as well as researchers and partner hospitals. And that's our show for you tonight. Thank you for watching. Dwight Drummond has your next local newscast tomorrow at 6. We are preempted by hockey at 11. Have a great night, everyone.